Um, this is an ant mound in Washington, and these Lepiota mushrooms are being used by the ants as part of their host defense. And we inoculated some piles of this, and next year we had Lepiota mushrooms all over our yard. And this is the parasol mushroom called Lepiota procera, delicious edible and choice mushroom. And then the next year we had hundreds of these parasol mushrooms. <laughs> Insects use fungi as part of their host defense mechanism to prevent other parasitic organisms. However, Dusty and I lived in what Dr. Andrew Weil called the worst house he's ever seen in North America. He's seen a lot of them. Our house was being decomposed and destroyed by carpenter ants. And so I went on the epa.gov homepage trying to find a fungus that was not a house syndrome fungus and not a, not a fungus that would hurt bees. And the EPA is very excited about a group called Metarhizium. These are mold-like fungi, but everybody in the literature and the scientific community said that these little white wedges that don't have spores to avoid them. I thought nature is a lot more clever than that. So I chased these, these little white wedges in culture. They're called sectors. And I was able to morph the culture into this state, pre-sporulation. And so one night, with my daughter and Dusty, I asked my daughter for a little Barbie doll dish, and I put it down here, right, with all the carpenter ants who are consuming constantly the house at night. The little the sawdust pile, I'm a good vacuumer, I do a lot of house cleaning. And I vacuum this one spot every day, and so I knew they were coming in there. And so I put down a little Barbie doll dish with 25 kernels of the white mycelium. And then my daughter, at around uh, midnight, had to walk past this dish. And because I inspired the, the excitement of science, she looked down and she goes, Oh my gosh, Dad, Dusty, wake up, you've got to see this. And this was swarming with carpenter ants. Now the big thing is over $10 million to $100 million has been spent by DuPont, Dow, all these chemical companies. You, you're looking for novel biopesticides. But they couldn't get over the spore repellency hurdle. The insects aren't stupid. They know the plague when they smell it. And so they'd come up to these bait stations, they'd put them around people's houses for termites and ants, and, they, and the insects would turn around and run away. So they never was able to commercialize. So I did this, and the mycelium is a super attractant to the very insects that would be repelled by this entomopathic genic fungus when it sporulates. So I hit the big home run. And uh, the carpenter ants become mummified, and then boing, a mushroom comes out of their head. <laughs> So th this, this is a, a photograph by, by, Lawrence, by Lawrence Gilbert, and I didn't know that these fungi were dimorphic. So the house comes down, and I got my first patent, December 9th, 2003. And then I started making, I started making extracts as the choice test, and we make the extracts of the mycelium, the termites and the ants go preferentially to the extract, and I got my second patent in October. This patent is for 200,000 species, all social insects. It's been called an Alexander Graham Bell patent. It could replace all chemical pesticides in the world in the next 20 to 30 years. It also, we can, we can invite in beneficial insects. So it's an extremely robust uh, patent invention that I hope um, can e have an enormous impact on saving lives and species on this planet and getting rid of nasty chemical pesticides. So we grow lots of reishi mushrooms. This is a Ganoderma lucidum, my good buddy Andy Weil. And we also grow turkey tails, Trimades versicolor. And we have been approved for the first clinical study in the United States uh, uh, using medicinal mushrooms, a $2.25 million breast cancer study at the University of Michigan, uh, at the University of Minnesota, and at Bastyr College. And one of the mushrooms I'm particularly keen on, and Dusty is too, is this old growth species called Fomitopsis officinalis, otherwise known as the Garricon, first described by Dioscorides uh, 2,000 years ago. It is a mushroom that's exclusive to the old growth forest, now thought to be extinct in Europe, even though Dioscorides described it, the trees have been cut down. And its exclusive residence in the old growth forest in the Northwest is, is critically important. I've been involved with the BioShield program for the past several years. This mushroom also has an ancient history and has a Venus of Willendorf form, so it's largely associated with, uh, with, women, with women pharmacopoeia. And we started making extracts of these mushrooms, and we submitted over 300 samples of the BioShield program, and lo and behold, we got the results uh, back uh, about two years ago. I was under confidentiality and couldn't speak about this publicly until there's a vetted press release by the, by the U U U.S. Defense Department, which you can Google under stamets and smallpox. And lo and behold, we hit the big home run against pox viruses, which includes vaccinia, cowpox, as well as smallpox. And there's a selectivity index, and Dr. Oral Kern is a smallpox expert. Any, any selectivity of two or more is considered active. Any 10 or greater is considered very active. We hit 20 and 29. 
You can Google and listen to an NPR.org uh, interview with me with the BioShield program uh, and uh, John Norris, a former assistant director of the FDA and the founder of the Bioterrorism Institute. Over 200,000 samples were screened. We had the best results of any, and the only, only active results of any natural product. There's a lot more that has happened now in the past year. I'm sworn by confidentiality not to reveal it, it, but there's a viral swarm on the horizon. After 1980, none of us have been, none of us have been immunized after that period of time, and the BioShield program sees a smallpox epidemic as being extremely uh, threatening. We have fantastic results against bird flu right now, H5N1, um, and against SARS. The civet cats kill birds. Civet cats carry SARS. Birds carry bird flu and West Nile virus. Mosquitoes carry those viruses to us. We're all involved in this viral potential pandemic in the making. So I thought more about how can I really save the world? And I came up with this, and I came up with a life box as a way of regreening the planet. And these are footprints that we make through life, and we have, an, we have a catastrophic effect on, on nature, and nature rebounds. So I filed a patent on this in actually 2001. We all get too many cardboard boxes, and so we, and, and, you, and or you get DVDs, perhaps of Taste 3. And so you, you get your box, you take out your DVD of Taste 3, and then you add water to the cardboard box. A 1% market share of cardboard in this country is 25,000 acres per week. Think of that, 25,000 uh, acres per week. And then I joined eight vegetables with one common friendly fungus, and so it's a uniform mycelial mat sewn into the corrugations of the cardboard. And so once you get the packages delivered, you soak the cardboard for about five days, and, and the spores germinate as well as the seeds, they're unified. Corns, beans, and squash, and I had onions. My wife thought, if you can grow this, anyone can grow this, because I'm not a gardener. And then so I took an old, uh, several buckets, an old bathtub, an old toilet, and the proverbial kitchen sink. <laughs> and then 12 weeks later, there's my garden from a life box. And so we harvested uh, onions, and if you use mycorrhizal fungi, you'll get huge onions. You won't get Daryl Hannah and Dusty, <laughs> but you'll get very, very large onions because these are fungal allies that enhance the growth of plants and give them host defense against diseases. So we take the corn uh, after harvest, and I developed this for DARPA. I was involved with the, with the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, and they love this idea. Um, and so then you can take the corn. And now watch this, this is three cobs of corn with mycelium. The mycelium is converting cellulose into sugars. And so, and watch what happens right here. Next day, next day, next day, next day, next day. You harvest the mushrooms, and this material is now edible with the cows, chickens, and pigs. But then I had another epiphany. For 30 years now, I've been converting cellulose into fungal carbohydrates. And so last September, I had a brainstorm and I thought, oh my gosh, this is a way of us creating ethanol. And so I trademark myconol and mycohol. And I see the incorporation of, of fungal knowledge from our ancestors using the lessons of evolution through the, theory of, the, through the theater of evolution has been trillions of experiments, most of which have failed, but the ones that have survived and through natural selection have allowed us to move forward. We exist because of symbiosis. When we become unsymbiotic, then we lose the, the legions of allies and microbes that have helped us get us here. So I believe incorporating these fungal systems into restoration types of strategies all over the world and that mushroom farms should not be called mushroom farms. They should be reinvented as healing arts centers. We have the power and the wisdom of nature behind us. If we can harness these mycological remedies, I think that we can do a lot to help save the planet. Thank you very much.